Here we go. So Dr. Bart Ehrman, the uh, kind of the subject of today's study in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman, he is an atheist or an agnostic, depending on which context he's in, but he may have turned more Christians into atheists than anybody else alive today. I say this because I know a lot of Christians have never heard of him, but when I have conversations and dialogue with people who say, I'm a, I was a Christian, I was raised as a Christian, and they have like an intellectual journey out of the faith. They almost always quote Bart Ehrman. They almost always refer to one of his books, like Jesus Interrupted or Misquoting Jesus or uh, Forged or something like that. So it really is worthwhile to take his content that's very persuasive, that is convincing lots of people to depart from the Christian faith. It's very useful to take that content and break it down. This is not a shots fired thing like Mike's going to rip Bart Ehrman apart. Like this is not, I don't even like that way of handling issues. I don't want to do that as a, as a Christian. I don't. I'm not going to, don't really want to go down that road, but I do want to take on his claims and I'm going to play clips of Bart Ehrman for you. And I want to show you how they're absolutely inarguably demonstrably false and misleading. So we're going to get into this today because he is a best-selling author. Again, one of the most influential atheists alive or agnostics alive today and very, very, very misleading in this case. So here's how we're going to start. I know we're in the Mark series. I know we're going verse by verse through the gospel of Mark and all that, but I told you sometimes I would stop and I would do these like topical things that are about the passage we're in. Well, we happen to be in the crucifixion of Jesus and this, the section where Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a place that is targeted by Bart Ehrman to mislead people in my opinion. But here's what I want to do. I'm going to play a clip of Bart Ehrman. This is like a three minute long clip, a little over three minutes. And I want you to listen to it thoughtfully. Don't just think, Whatever he says is wrong. I already know it. I don't have to think about it. Like actually consider what he says and imagine that he's your college professor or you've been invited to an event where he's speaking and he says this three minute statement. How does it affect you? How does it impact you? Maybe you're an atheist. Maybe you listen and you go, yes, I knew it. I knew that the gospels were all contradictory and nonsense. How does it impact you? And then I'm going to break it down step by step. We're going to go through it thoughtfully. Here we go. This is the clip. Sometimes the differences are not discrepancies in detail. Sometimes they're differences in emphases that really matter. I'll give you one example. Mark has a very powerful portrayal of Jesus going to his death. Jesus has been uh, betrayed by one of his followers. He's turned over to Pontius Pilate. And during his trial, Jesus doesn't say anything to Pontius Pilate, except Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, "Su leges, you say so. That's all he says. He's taken out to be crucified. He doesn't say anything. He's got, he goes to the place of crucifixion. He's silent the entire way. They nail him to the cross, and he's silent. You get the idea of Jesus being in shock at what's happening to him. While he's on the cross, everybody mocks him. The Roman soldiers mock him. The people passing by mock him. Both other people being crucified mock him in Mark's gospel. At the end, Jesus, who has been betrayed and denied and deserted and handed over and condemned and mocked, Jesus on the cross finally cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. Jesus goes to a painful, humiliating death unsure of why it's happening to him in Mark's gospel. Contrast that with Luke's gospel. In Luke, you have some of the same elements, but a very, very different emphasis. In Luke's gospel, when Jesus is going to be crucified, he's not silent. He sees some women by the side of the road, and he tell, turns his head to them, and he's, well, he's carrying his cross, and he says to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the fate that's to befall you. Here, Jesus isn't in shock, not wondering what's, what's, why this is happening. He's concerned about these people more than himself. While being nailed to the cross in Luke's gospel, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's not in Mark. That's in Luke. While Jesus is hanging on the cross, it's not that both robbers mock him. One of the crucified people mocks him, and the other turns his head to the man and says to be quiet because Jesus hasn't done anything to deserve this. He then looks to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And Jesus replies to him in Luke, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is not somebody who's wondering why this is happening to him. He knows what's happening to him, he knows why it's happening to him, and he knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise, and this guy's going to be with him. At the end, most telling of all, in Luke's gospel, instead of crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, and dies. Jesus does not feel forsaken in Luke's gospel. This is a very different portrayal from the one you get in Mark. And the mistake people make is pretending that what Mark has to say is the same thing that Luke has to say. And that what Luke has to say is the same thing that Mark has to say. These are two different gospels with two different points of view. And if you smash them together into one kind of mega gospel, you have ruined the emphasis of each one. That's the clip. And I want us to um, be thoughtful today, like really work through this, think through this. We need to understand what Dr. Ehrman is concluding. And we also need to understand something else, which is how he builds that conclusion. Because that's that's the whole video. It's just that it's here's here's the conclusion I'm giving you. These are different and contradictory emphasis in the Gospel of Mark. But you need to know why he is supporting this conclusion or how he's supporting it with these different evidences he brings. And that's where the misleading comes in. This is where and it's I know if if you respect Dr. Bart Ehrman, and he's brilliant. The guy's brilliant, and he's done a lot of smart things. Okay, like I'm I'm not trying to be condescending here. But we got to deal with facts, and this is utterly misleading, and um, we're going to talk about that. So the conclusions are what I want us to, to first look at, then we'll walk through the reasoning. So I'm going to play this clip again, not the whole clip, just the, the 47 second clip here for you, for you to hear the conclusions. This is what a Bart Ehrman concludes. It's very important that we understand his conclusions. We don't overstate or understate what he's actually concluding. Here it is. You get the idea of Jesus being in shock at what's happening to him. Jesus goes to a painful, humiliating death, unsure of why it's happening to him in Mark's gospel. Contrast that with Luke's gospel. Here, Jesus isn't in shock, not wondering what's, what's, why this is happening. He's concerned about these people more than himself. This is not somebody who's wondering why this is happening to him. He knows what's happening to him, he knows why it's happening to him, and he knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise, and this guy's going to be with him. Jesus does not feel forsaken in Luke's gospel. This is a very different portrayal from the one you get in Mark. So you catch that. The, the, the conclusion is, yes, Mark and Luke have their own portrayal of Jesus. The emphasis isn't... It's not about historical Jesus studies. It's about what Mark is saying about Jesus, what Luke is saying about Jesus, and how they're they're very different. And the obvious implication is that they are irreconcilably contradictory. Um, now, how would this impact you if if you were the student and he's your professor in college? And he's like the smartest guy you've ever met, right? And you're you're sitting there and he says all this, and you're sitting there thinking, ah. Uh, Oh man, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess maybe he's right. Like, oh gosh, oh no. And I mean, I remember being a, a teen, a late, late teens going into university and hearing some of the professors saying certain things, not like they were all doing this, right? But there was, there were, there were those guys and they did say those things. And if you didn't really study on your own, you just didn't know and you could easily be misled. So in Mark, Jesus doesn't know what's happening to him, doesn't know why it's happening. And he doesn't have any sort of future hope about what's going to happen next. In Luke, according to Bart Ehrman, Luke, uh, Jesus knows what's happening to him, why it's happening, and he knows what's going to happen after he's going to wake up in paradise. Jesus feels forsaken in Mark's gospel, and this is important, Jesus does not feel forsaken in Luke's gospel. I'm going to break down Mark and Luke now, and we're going to see that Bart Ehrman mostly, mostly misrepresents Mark, not Luke. For the most part, he's radically distorting Mark. I mean, radically, horribly distorting Mark, ignoring Mark entirely uh, to construct a false contradiction here that has is, is misleading and convincing to millions of people. Uh, this is kind of what he does in his literature, in his popular level works in particular, not the scholarly stuff, but the popular level stuff. He tends to do this. And today is going to be a good example of that. So let's look at the Gospel of Mark and how uh, Dr. Ehrman's work is mostly in mis misrepresenting Mark, not Luke. And we'll see uh, that you can do this. I could do this with a video where I respond and break down each point he 
you know, he brought one by one. I could never do it in a debate because in a debate he could give three minutes of info that takes you know forty minutes to to to, to deal with because it's just misleading. So. One by one, we'll take his points and consider them. The first point he makes about Mark is that Jesus is betrayed by Judas. Jesus is betrayed by Judas. That's the first point he made in the three-minute clip I played for you. Now, the strange thing here is that this doesn't actually help Ehrman's conclusion because what he doesn't mention is that Jesus is also betrayed by Judas in Luke's gospel. And his whole point is that Mark and Luke present a different emphasis, but Mark and Luke both say that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. So this this would be strange. Um, what you could do, if I want to try to you know, steel man, Bart Ehrman's points a little bit more, is you could say that this is being used to imply that Jesus didn't expect the betrayal by Judas. He was shocked by it. It led to his shock, him looking on the, on the cross, finally saying, I, what's going on? I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I'm forsaken. I don't, I don't understand. Um, so you could say in Mark's gospel, Jesus didn't expect Judas to betray him. But again, the problem here is that that's not Mark's gospel. That's just something someone's making up. Let's look at Mark's gospel for ourselves. Here's Jesus talking about his betrayal before it happens, meaning he what? Expects it. But it gives us more than that. The scripture has so often already refuted misleading claims before they've even been made because God's really smart like that. So Mark 14, 18 says, as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who's eating with me. Jesus says it. Then they began to be grieved and say to him one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the 12, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the son of man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he'd not been born. What does he say? The son of man is to go just as it is written. This is a purpose statement. Jesus, not only does he predict his betrayal in Mark's gospel, but he gives a purpose, a reason for his betrayal, which is it's according to the scriptures, meaning that Jesus expects himself to be betrayed. And there's a sense of trust in the plan that this is part of the plan. That's the, that's the emphasis in Mark's gospel. Jesus expects it and sees it as a necessary fulfillment of scripture. That's You wouldn't get that listening to Bart Ehrman, but you would get that reading the gospel of Mark. So we can ask the next question, which is, does Mark intend us to think of Jesus as expecting betrayal, perhaps, but not crucifixion? Because I'm trying to sort of steel man... Um, Bart Ehrman's claims here. So is it possible that maybe Jesus expects betrayal by Judas, but in Mark's gospel, he's not expecting the cross so that he was betrayed by Judas. He thought he was going to get out of it somehow. And then he ends up on the cross and now he's in shock. Uh, no, it's not possible. And the reason is because of what Jesus says in Mark's gospel. So Mark 9 31, Jesus says, for he, it says, for he was telling, uh, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the son of man is to be delivered into the hands of men. That's about the betrayal of Judas and they will kill him. So he, he expects to die. He fully expects it. He knows what's happening. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. What did, what did Bart Ehrman say about Mark? Jesus, according to Mark, doesn't know what's going to happen after the cross. He's, he's without hope. He's in despair. He doesn't know what the future holds. Unlike Luke, where suddenly Jesus knows the future. But Jesus in Mark 9.31 predicts his betrayal, his death, and his resurrection. Again, in Mark 10.45, uh, For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served. I always quote that wrong for some reason. Did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, why do I quote this verse? And I'm going to quote this verse a few times today. Um, this phrase, giving his life a ransom for many, is one of the many, many allusions to Isaiah 53 in the Gospel of Mark, especially it really ramps up the Isaiah 53 allusions when we get to the actual crucifixion scene, because Mark's emphasis is about how this is part of the plan, not a shock, not a unexpected thing from Jesus. Uh, rather, Jesus is the only one who knows the plan in the Gospel of Mark. He's the only one who really understands it. And he's like, through the Gospel of Mark, trying to drill it into the head of the disciples that he has to die for people. That he's going to die as a ransom. He's going to give his blood to suffer for others. Mark 14, 40, uh, 14, 24, we have another verse that relates to this idea that was Jesus, perhaps he expected betrayal, but not crucifixion. Mark 14, 24, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now, this is him saying, I'm going to die. I will be the sacrifice to establish a new covenant That'll be the new covenant. The only new covenant in the Old Testament is Jeremiah. So he's seeing this as being the forgiveness of sins, giving you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is in the mind of Jesus. It's not shock. Whatever it is, it's not shock. It's not failed expectations. Rather, he expects all these things to happen. 
Now, he also says his blood is poured out for the many. In Mark 10, 45, he said ransomed for the many. Well, scholars generally think, and um, I've already taught through this, so I won't go into the detail of it, but that this is a reference to Isaiah 53, 12. Um, he poured out himself to death and he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sins of many. This is the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. So this phrase, the many, is being used by Jesus. It's like a, uh, it's like an indicator that Isaiah 53 is being referred to when he talks about him being poured out to provide forgiveness for others. It's Isaiah 53. Now, Bart Ehrman, Dr. Ehrman, he wants us to think that we're supposed to think of what Mark is saying. I want to know the context of Mark. Like, you know, if you don't know your stuff, when Bart Ehrman comes around, He's like, you Christians, you, you know, effectively, here's the implication. You clumsily smash the gospels together and you have a weird version of Jesus that doesn't really agree with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John because you're smashing them all together. I'm just going to read Mark and get Mark's emphasis and I'll let it stand. I'll get Luke's emphasis and let it stand. Now, I think informed, thoughtful readers of the scriptures realize and get excited at the idea that Mark, Matthew, Luke, John all have different emphasis. What Bart Ehrman's really saying is that their emphasis, emphases, emphasizals, are so different from each other as to be utterly contradictory. Okay, so we see Matthew emphasizing prophecy. We see John emphasizing the theology of the nature of Christ. We see um, uh, Mark emphasizing this the messianic secret theme, the idea that, that Jesus has to be the suffering one who dies for our sins. It's the revelation of what the purpose of the Messiah was. We see these different emphases going on in the Gospels. But the problem is that in order to construct Bart Ehrman's emphasis of Mark, he totally distorts Mark. He ignores countless places in Mark and just constructs cherry-picked passages. And this is a problem. The next thing that uh, Bart Ehrman says about the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is silent. He is silent in a lot of ways. Okay, he's silent uh, before Pilate. He only says one thing to Pilate. He doesn't say anything on his way to the cross. We'll deal with that. He doesn't say anything on the cross except for one statement about being forsaken. We'll deal with that as well. Let's take the first one. Pilate, Jesus before Pilate. So Dr. Ehrman wants us to think that Mark is saying the words he records that Jesus says are the only words Jesus says. Then it creates conflict with Luke because if you go to another gospel, say Luke, John, and it has Jesus saying something during the discussion with Pilate more than you say so, if Jesus says something, then now it's a conflict, right? Now there's a contradiction between these things. But Mark doesn't actually say this. Mark never in, in this whole passage in the many hours of the day. It never says the only thing Jesus said during this three hours was this one phrase. It's never in the gospel of Mark. We'll look at Mark right now and confirm this. Mark chapter 15 verses one through five. Does Jesus say nothing or does Mark say something a little different? And we'll look at Mark's actual emphasis because um, we care about that. Right? Like I care about, I believe God inspired the word. And while some would think, well, that makes you a blinded Christian, Mike. You can't really evaluate rationally the Bible because you believe it. And and I, I understand how some might think that, but I, I think you're mistaken. Um, the truth is that I, I think the Bible has so much authority that I have a great desire to understand it accurately, to not change the emphasis of any passage of scripture from what it actually is, because I think that that's God's authority right there. So I want to say what it really says. But in Mark 15, 1, it says, Early in the morning, the chief priests and elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Now, Bart Ehrman says he only said one thing during this season, during this time, whereas in Luke, Jesus says more. Well, let's look at what Mark says. Pilate questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, it is as you say. That's the word suleges that uh, Dr. Ehrman refers to. I actually talked about this, I think, in the last study on the Mark series a few weeks ago. And it, it's a really interesting thing in Greek. It basically he says, um, yes, I am the king, but not in the way you think. So it's a way of affirming the truth of a statement, but, but not affirming the position the person has about it, right? Like it's like, yes, but not how you think. Really interesting phrase Jesus uses there. Then the chief priest began accusing, to accuse him harshly. Now this enters a new season of the discussion with Pilate. This is the accusations of Jesus. They're trying to get Jesus in trouble. So they accuse him before the judge, Pilate. So they accuse him. Then Pilate questioned him saying, do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. And there you go. No further answer. So Pilate was amazed. This is this section, these five verses, is what Bart Ehrman is referring to when he says that Jesus says nothing before Pilate except the phrase, you say so. Here's the problem. 
if you read Mark carefully, you find that, and this is consistent with Luke as well, Jesus isn't uh, being portrayed as saying nothing at all. He's being portrayed as saying nothing in his defense in a criminal case. There's a difference between being utterly silent and not giving a defense. That's how Mark presents Jesus. He doesn't give a defense to the accusers. He does this when he's before the, the high priest. He offers no defense to the accusations they bring, but he still speaks. He does this before Pilate. He offers no defense, but he still speaks. This is consistent with Luke as well. Let's look at Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 4. Then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. These are specific accusations. Luke records more detail than, than Mark does. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. That's actually the Greek. It's the same su leges. It's the same words in the Greek. So Luke has that. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, uh, saying he stirs up the people and they continue to accuse him. Notice this, that Luke is consistent. Luke has the exact same record as Mark. Jesus is accused. The only thing he affirms before Pilate that they record is that he's the king of the Jews, but perhaps not in the way that Pilate would be led to believe. And that's it. This is not even a difference in Matthew and Mark. So why bring this up? To tell a distorted story between Mark and Luke. To mislead people for whatever purpose. I don't look, I don't care what Bart Ehrman's motives are. This isn't about me analyzing him. Like I'm putting him on a microscope and I'm slicing him open to figure out what his secret motives are. Like, I don't care. Like if I talk to him, I want to talk to him about his motives. I don't want to talk to you about that. Like I want to talk to us, like we have this discussion about the fact that his information is having an impact in people's lives that is misleading them about the truth of Christ. So that's kind of a big deal. That's what I want to talk about. Not at all seeking to attack him. I almost wish I could talk about this without bringing up anybody's names, but um, that's it, it, that would be uh, unhelpful to people because they wouldn't know who I was referring to <laughs> and what I was refuting. So he's telling a distorted version of the story that sees differences as contradictions. Uh, Jesus is not totally silent. He's silent about a certain issue. But Bart Ehrman totally misses Mark's emphasis of why Jesus is silent. In Bart's version of Mark, over here, we'll say this is Bart's Mark. In Bart's Mark, Mark is saying, hey guys, Jesus was silent before Pilate because he was in shock. He was confused. He had nothing to say. He was just dumbstruck. In Mark's version of Mark, Jesus is silent before Pilate because he won't defend himself. Because Jesus thinks that it's according to scripture that he's going to get crucified and he will not lift a finger to stop it from happening. Don't you get it? His silence about his accusations gets him in more trouble. That's the emphasis in Mark. It's the opposite of what Bart Ehrman is thinking. It is his faith and belief about what the cross is about. That's why he continues to move forward. So Mark is telling us that Jesus dies intentionally and sacrificially. I'll, I'll briefly mention, I have so much, as always, I have so much stuff to share with you guys. So I'll briefly mention a few verses you could look up on your own relating to this. Um, in Mark 14, 61 and 15, 5, in those verses, it alludes to Isaiah 53, 7, where a servant voluntarily offers himself to suffer for the sins of others. Kind of a big deal. In Isaiah 53, 6 and verse 12, it uses the phrase handed over about the suffering servant of Isaiah. That he's going to be handed over. And Mark alludes to this no less than 10 times. Mark, um, Mark 9, 31, 10, 33, 14 verses 10 and 11, 14, 18, 14, 21, 14, 41, 14, 42, 15, 10, and 15, 15. All of those verses in Mark allude to the Isaiah 53 uh, suffering servant who is being handed over handed over that he might suffer for the sins of others that they could be forgiven. Mark intends us to see Jesus in the context of Isaiah 53. It's pretty obviously Mark's emphasis. He's a righteous sufferer, not a shocked, I don't know what's going on person, but a righteous sufferer who dies for others, thereby saving them. And he overcomes and has future hope. Let's look at another passage where Jesus talks when he's arrested. So we can see in Mark, I mean, it, it hurts me. It hurts me how badly Mark has been utterly misrepresented that all you have to do is read through the gospel of Mark after hearing Ehrman's claims and you're like, what is he talking about? So this is kind of a big deal. Mark 14 verses 48 and 49. This is Jesus. This is his attitude, his mindset. After Judas has betrayed him, while he's standing before the high priest, right, when, when, when they're about to carry him off in bonds, and this is what Jesus says, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But this has taken place because I'm totally confused and have no idea what's going on. 
right? No, <laughs> like, that's obnoxious, right? It says, this is taking place to fulfill the scriptures. That is Jesus's opinion about what is happening in the gospel um, and in Mark in particular. So that is kind of a big deal, kind of a big deal. Knowing Jesus is going to be betrayed. He says it's according to the scriptures, knowing he'll be crucified as well. And then later, Jesus is not in a progressive state of shock and dismay, right? In Mark 14, 62, here's Jesus later on standing before the high priest as they're condemning him when all his disciples are fleeing and there's some that are sort of hiding and hide out and stuff like that. Jesus says to the high priest, I am the, I am the, 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 the Messiah, the, the son of the blessed one. So Jesus affirms that he is that right before the high priest. And then he says this, predicts the future. Um, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus predicts that after this time, when he's crucified, after his betrayal, he's going to come in judgment and stand in judgment over the very people who are judging him. Jesus is not in despair. Jesus is in agony in Mark's gospel, in Luke's gospel as well. Total agony. But agony and despair are very different things. Agony has to do with degree of pain and hardship and suffering. Despair has to do with lack of hope for the future. And I would never use that word despair. Jesus was not in despair. He was in agony. Um, so the, uh, yeah, let's look at another claim of Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman says that Jesus says nothing on the way to the cross. That's another phrase. He's, he's, he's building his case for why Mark is so different than Luke. And he says, Jesus says nothing on the way to the cross. Somebody would think, like if you don't go back and read Mark, you would just think, well, Bart Ehrman knows this stuff. He's a scholar. The guy's got like millions and millions of book sales. He's very highly regarded and, um, and right? This, this, this is a guy I should trust. Okay. He says that Mark has Jesus saying nothing on his way to the cross, but let's actually look at what Mark says, because you would think for you to conclude Mark's Jesus has nothing on the way to the cross. You actually have to have something in Mark where he says Jesus was silent on his way to the cross, right? but that's not what Mark says. Mark 15, 20, after they'd mocked him, they took the purple robe off of him and put his own garments on him and they let him out to crucify him. So now Jesus is on his way to the cross. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated a place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Remember that phrase? We'll come back to that in a minute. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. So that's Jesus on his way to the cross until he's on the cross. Boom. And Jesus, it's true, he doesn't say anything in Mark's gospel. But there's a difference between Jesus doesn't say anything and Mark has Jesus saying nothing. These are very different things. Because in the same sense Jesus doesn't say anything, I could say that Jesus doesn't breathe. In fact, nobody breathes in the entire gospel of Mark. Have you ever noticed this? But nobody breathed as far as Mark wants to emphasize that nobody breathed in the first century because he never mentions anybody breathing, except perhaps when Jesus breathed his, his last. I don't know if Mark mentions that. We'll come back to that later. Um, probably the only time. So obviously Mark's not trying to suggest that. This is, this is not the emphasis of Mark. But if you look at the passage, this isn't about Jesus, not about what he does. Jesus on the way to the crucifixion in Mark's gospel is not about what Jesus did on his way to the cross. It's about what they did to Jesus. So you can see this if you read the passage carefully. It uses the phrase they over and over again. And only one time does it tell us something Jesus did on his journey to the cross. So they mocked him in Mark 15 here. They mocked him. They put a purple robe on him. They led him out to crucify him. They made Simon carry his cross. They brought him to Golgotha. They tried to give him wine and myrrh. They crucified him. They took his garments. And then finally, the last they is they crucified him. So we have nine they's. We only have one statement of something Jesus did in that entire time. That is, he did not drink the wine mixed with myrrh. That's in Mark 15, 23. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in Mark's gospel, He's actually not telling you what Jesus did or didn't say on his way to the cross because his emphasis is what was done to Jesus, not what Jesus was doing. Do you see that? The only time he mentioned something Jesus did is in response to something they did to Jesus. They tried to give him the wine. Maybe he says, no, I don't want it. But he says he wouldn't drink it. Do you, do you have to have him silent not drinking it? Is that like required? That's just weird. We're just forcing things into scripture here that it's not, it's not a good way to read anything. Okay, in addition, so we talked about Jesus on his way to the cross. Let's talk about Jesus on the cross. According to Bart Ehrman, Jesus says nothing on the cross in Gospels Mark. 
in the gospels, in the gospel of Mark. This is significant because again, it's not like saying we don't know what Jesus said on the cross because Mark doesn't tell us. Rather, he says Jesus says nothing until at the very end, six hours later on the cross, he cries out, why have you forsaken me? Let's actually read the passage and see if it indicates Jesus said nothing. Mark 14 starting or 15, starting in verse 25. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Notice the they's. The, still, the emphasis is not what Jesus was doing because we want to know what was done to him. That's Mark's emphasis. They crucified him, uh, two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Mark wants you to know what people said to him. Verse 31, in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. We don't have any statements about what Jesus did or didn't say. There's nothing there. There's just nothing there. Then when the sixth hour came, he was on the cross for quite a long time and the sixth hour comes, so that's like 3 p.m. Uh, or uh, noon, excuse me, from, it's about noon, uh, their time, or the way we think of time, whatever. It's, it's the middle of the day. Uh, darkness ca- fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At, and then G- did Mark just skips three whole hours. He just skips, no narration, three hours and no narration. Uh, then at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Now, what we don't have is Mark saying Jesus said nothing except this. He was silent until the ninth hour. We just don't have any of that. We have six hours of Jesus on the cross. We have Mark wanting us to know what people said to him and about him. Nothing about what Jesus said or didn't say. That's Mark's emphasis. <laughs> it's just it's just about the, what was done to him. It's eisegesis or bad Bible study or just bad literary work to suggest that what's not mentioned didn't happen. Right? Like you would you would have to say that the only words spoken while Jesus was on the cross altogether were these phrases about mocking him. Like nobody even said like, hey, uh, you want to get dinner later? Like nobody's, well, certainly no one could have said that because Mark didn't narrate it. Like this is just weird. Anyway, I think I've made that point. Um, Based on Mark's account, could Jesus have said more stuff? Mm -hmm. Yes, he could have. In Mark's account, the emphasis is Jesus says nothing to get himself out of being crucified. But the door is open for Jesus to say any number of other things during a large amount of time that Mark simply doesn't talk about what Jesus was doing. That's, that's fine. The conclusion, the conclusion that Bart Ehrman comes to is that Jesus is in shock. That conclusion I hope I've demonstrated is, for Mark is utterly fallacious. Like this is super wrong. Uh, Dr. Ehrman has projected the attitude of Peter in Mark's gospel onto Jesus in Mark's gospel. Peter is the one who doesn't know what's going on. Peter's the one who wouldn't believe that the cross was going to happen and didn't believe that it had a purpose when it started to happen. That's Peter. Peter later changes his mind, later becomes a, you know, a whole different perspective. But during that time, Peter's the guy that doesn't get it. Peter's the guy that's confused. Peter's the guy who is in despair and shock. Jesus is not. Jesus is not at all. Um, There's a possible rescue for Bart Ehrman that somebody might give at this point, which is that they might say, Dr. Ehrman, uh, he's he's not really referring to Mark's, Mark's portrayal of Jesus. He's referring to the elusive historical Jesus. If you guys have never heard this before, the phrase historical Jesus is a very squirrely term. Um, It refers to like, hey, let's try to reconstruct what really happened, historically speaking. And then from there on out, people come up with a wide variety of different versions of Jesus, right? They'll select certain parts of the gospels. They'll they'll, they'll say that's authentic. Um, That really goes back to Jesus. That's a tradition from later. And they'll construct kind of a weird version of Jesus. And it's always ends up being weird. Um, Long story there, but that's what happens. But the problem with this is that Bart Ehrman specifically says that this is not the historical Jesus, that this is Mark's version of Jesus. Let me play that clip again because I just don't want people to miss it. It's just 12 seconds. Listen. Jesus goes to a painful, humiliating death, unsure of why it's happening to him in Mark's gospel. In Mark's gospel. So Ehrman's emphasis is this is how Mark portrays Jesus. And I hope I've demonstrated this is the opposite of how Mark portrays Jesus. That whatever, I don't want to get into motives. I don't care, right? I care about the information, the impact it has on you. The people being impacted by this misinformation, how it justifies unbelief, 
unjustifiably <laughs> in many people's lives, this kind of thing. The whole idea of the messianic revelation of Mark, as I've labored, you could go and watch the other 64 Bible studies in the gospel of Mark. Yeah, you could watch the whole series. And you'll see the messianic emphasis in Mark's gospel is that Jesus is the one who wants to drill into people's hearts and minds that the purpose of the Messiah is to die for our sins, to rise from the dead, and that that's the agenda. That's the whole idea that this is the, the major thing in Mark is um, first century Jews having a misunderstanding of what the Messiah was going to do at his first coming and Jesus trying to clear it up. Right? That's Mark's emphasis. That's Jesus in the gospel of Mark. Uh, Jesus gets it. He's the only one who does. It's everybody else that doesn't get it. Barney Ehrman puts that attitude on Jesus and ignores so much, so much of what is actually in the gospel. Let's talk briefly about everyone mocking Jesus. Um, Barney Ehrman makes a big point about this. Everybody's mocking Christ. Everybody's mocking Jesus. And this is seemingly to reinforce that Jesus doesn't know what's going on, that that the mockery is hitting his heart in a way that says, I, I didn't I didn't think this was going to happen. Like, I'm in shock now. Um but let me go to Luke and we'll see that Luke also emphasizes the same thing because here we're just creating differences between the gospels that don't exist. I see scholars do this all the time. Not all scholars, not, not by any stretch of the imagination, just some, okay? <laughs> but we see this all the time. Here's what Luke says about the mockery Jesus experienced. And it's just like Mark. Luke twenty two sixty three. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. And they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, prophesy, who's the one hitting you? So they cover his face and punch him and then ask him to say who hit him. That's some serious mockery. And they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming. In Luke 23, verse 11, we have more of the mockery. And Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Then we have more mockery in Luke 23, verse 21. But they kept on calling out, saying, crucify, crucify him. Now, let this hit your heart. These are the Jewish people stirred up by the high priests calling out for the killing of Jesus. Like this is, this is even next level. This is beyond just mocking someone, making fun of them. They're like, kill him, please. Can we kill him? They're calling out for it. Now, to be fair, if I'm going to try to steal man, Bart Ehrman's case a bit more, um, he could point to a crowd in Luke that seems absent in Mark. Okay, in Luke, there is a crowd that you don't find in the Gospel of Mark. Well, maybe we'll get there in a second. But in Luke 23, 21, which is not the verse I want, 27, there it is. This is him on his way to, to the cross. And, and Bart Ehrman refers to this too. So following him was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. So Jesus actually has supporters in Luke's Gospel. Okay, this is something you don't really see Mark emphasizing. That's true. There's an emphasis difference going on there. We'll talk about whether it's a contradiction or not in a second. Um, but Jesus turns and he says to them, oh, daughters of Jerusalem. We'll talk about that as well, how Jesus is concerned for others in Luke, but according to Dr. Ehrman, not in Mark. Um, so you could say this is not in Mark. There's a large crowd of people who are lamenting him. This is not present in Mark. Maybe Mark's intentionally leaving that out for a different emphasis. Perhaps some would think that's contradictory. But here's the thing. Mark shows that Jesus did have a large following from Galilee. People followed him to Jerusalem. When they cry out, Hosanna, and they it's Palm Sunday. I've, I've said this before, before I was even digging into the, this, these Bart Ehrman claims, where I, my case is that the people who say Hosanna are not the same people who say crucify him. I already think I've built a pretty strong case for that. I think this will reinforce it as well. But Mark shows G, that Jesus has a large group of followers and there are indications that the crowd saying crucify him was planted by Jewish leaders and they represent more of the Jerusalem crowd, not the Galilee crowd who had who are more of the followers of Christ. Mark also highlights women who follow Jesus from the cross to the tomb. Let's look at this passage because <clears throat> Mark also has a crowd of women. Mark 15, 40 that some people miss. And it's consistent with Luke. There were also some women looking on from a distance. These are supporters of Jesus, as we read on in, in, in Mark. And they're looking on, they're watching from a distance as Jesus is being crucified. It makes sense that they followed to the crucifixion location as well. And among the, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and the less and Joseph and Salome. And it goes on, it says, when he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women, many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So Jesus has a crowd of women who were following him. And Mark wants to highlight them. Mark highlights them for perhaps a different purpose than Luke. Luke wants us to see the full scene. Perhaps he's trying to show us 
um, the hardship of watching Jesus being crucified and let that hit our hearts. Um, Mark wants to highlight these specific ladies, these Mary, these two Marys, right? And then Salome, because they're going to be key witnesses in the evidence for the empty tomb, which I'll get to next week. That's going to be fun. So Mark has a different emphasis, but there's, it's a consistent story. Is it a contradictory account? By no means. Then we get to the cry. I'll come back to this, but I just want to mention it so no one thinks I'm leaving it out. Okay, this this cry, what's called the cry of der dereliction in scholarly literature, that's what they call it. This is the phrase, right? My God, why have you forsaken me? Mark has Jesus crying this out on the cross. This is what Bart Ehrman interprets to say that Jesus doesn't know why he's dying. He doesn't know what's going on. But I would say this totally ignores everything Jesus has said in Mark. And I'm going to return to this later to show why this doesn't mean what Bart Ehrman would take it to mean. And many people would take it to mean that Jesus is on the cross um, it, it's a failure. I give up. Everything's failed. Even God has forsaken me. It's all over. We'll talk more about that after we get into Luke. So Luke, the gospel of Luke, there's not as much to say about Luke as there was about Mark. Um, but according to Dr. Ehrman on the way to the cross, Jesus is not silent, but he's thinking of others more than himself. Okay. That's not a very significant observation to make. But he's making it as an observation of a contradiction or a different emphasis, at least, a different emphasis between Mark and Luke. So let's look at Luke and then let's compare that to Mark and ask if Jesus is consistent, okay? Is there a consistent statement about Jesus between Mark and Luke here? Luke 23, 28. But Jesus turned to them, turning to them, said, daughters, this is about the women following, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that have never bore and the breasts that have never nursed. And then they'll begin to say the mountains fall on us. And he's, he's saying, hey, um, judgment's coming to Jerusalem. Weep for yourselves. So this is Jesus having more concern, according to, to Dr. Ehrman, for others than he does for himself. I agree. Okay, I agree. The question is, does Mark show us the same Jesus? Jesus who's more concerned for others than himself. This seems like an easy yes, but let me make it harder. Does Jesus, in light of his own death, specifically when it comes to his dying on the cross, is he more concerned for others or himself in Mark's gospel? So Mark 10, 45, back to this verse. For even the son of man did not come to serve, uh, to be served. Like I said, I always... I don't know why I always quote that wrong. Did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is about his death. He's going to give his life a ransom. He's going to die to ransom others. Jesus sees his death in light of it being for others, not himself. That's the whole context of Jesus's death in the gospel of Mark. This is kind of like Christianity 101, but sometimes we got to go back to that stuff. Mark 14, 27, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Now, why, why am I quoting this passage? Because here's Jesus talking about his um, being stricken, his death, and how they're all going to fall away. But he cares enough about them to tell them there's still hope. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. He cares about them. He goes, you guys are about to go through hard times. Let me give you a prediction so that you can be ready for this. Mark will tap into this Galilee prediction at the end of the gospel of Mark when he, when the uh, the angel proclaims that he's going to, he's going to meet them in Galilee. We'll talk more about that later. That's in a few weeks from now. That's awesome too. Kind of like everything in the gospel of Mark. Um, then there is uh, Mark 14, 38. Now this passage is especially interesting to see Jesus's attitude in Mark, according to Mark. Jesus' attitude about the cross and about the suffering he's experiencing. Here, when he is he is like praying, God, you know, let this cup pass for me, Father, let this cup pass for me. He's praying all that. So he's obviously concerned and in agony, not despair, about the cross. But he also turns to the disciples and he says, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus is worried and concerned, maybe concern is a better word here, but Jesus is concerned about the disciples. He knows that they're about to face a horrible trial too. Not as bad as the one Jesus is going through, but they're going to face a horrible trial. And he stops all of his concerns about himself to stop and say, guys, pray that you won't enter into temptation because they're about to go through hardship as well. Jesus cares about others, not just himself. In fact, more than himself in, gospel, in the gospel of Mark, because that's why he goes to the cross. On the cross, another emphasis seen as a difference by Dr. Ehrman is that on the cross in Luke, Jesus prays for others to be forgiven, for others to be forgiven, right? But Mark 2, and I won't go through the whole passage, but you could look it up on your own. When Jesus heals the paralytic, 
in Mark chapter 2, he, he's, he's, his whole point, now this is one of the first miracles of Jesus in Mark. And Mark wants to set up that you know that Jesus comes not just to heal, but to forgive. And he actually heals the man just so that people will know he has the ability to forgive others. So is the, I'm doing this to forgive you, is that an emphasis in Mark's gospel? Absolutely. The Isaiah 53 connections, I could, I could spend the whole day on just that one issue. It's the whole purpose of the cross. In Luke, Jesus prays for others to be forgiven while on the cross. In Mark and Luke, Jesus dies for others to be forgiven. So how is this a contradiction? Um, so yeah, it's different, but it's not contradictory. In, now, here's another one that I think stumbles a lot of people. In Mark, both thieves mock Jesus. In Luke, according to Ehrman, only one thief mocks Jesus. The other gets a promise. Hey, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's absent in Mark, but I'm going to argue it's not contradictory. Um, what happens in Mark's gospel is this: they're, they're, everybody's mocking Jesus and it's all recorded, including both guys on the cross. But what happens in Luke's gospel can be seen as consistent with this because of one important detail. In Luke's gospel, the thief on the cross who converts seems to convert on the cross. Why is that significant? Because Luke doesn't have him being a follower of Jesus who is crucified next to him. He has him as being a bad guy who turns to Christ while on the cross. This is a deathbed conversion. So all I'm suggesting is this. If the man becomes a believer while on the cross, it's probably some of the events on the cross that lead him to believe in Jesus. Right? He wasn't already a believer. The, um, the, the statement in Mark that he's mocking initially could lead to later him converting when he sees things like darkness on the land, he sees the attitude of Jesus, and maybe just the work of the Holy Spirit in the man's life, he turns and puts faith in Christ. There's no contradiction here. Different emphasis, I agree, but not not contradiction. So, um, yeah, what happens in Luke looks like, looks like a conversion moment. I think most of us would agree with that. Then there's something that Luke has Jesus saying on the cross, another thing in Luke that Dr. Ehrman points out, which is Luke 23, 46. He says, Jesus says it in Mark uh, this way, and in Luke he says this other thing, and it's presented, the implication, if you watch the video, is that Luke and Mark have Jesus saying really conflicting different things, because they're both trying to give you a different version, ultimately, of Jesus. Luke 23, 46, says here, and Jesus crying with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, you notice that crying with a loud voice phrase, let's remember that. Into your hands I commit my spirit. So this is like a, a, a statement of faith. He calls God Father, a relational term. Um, he's he's he breathes his last after he says this. So there's like a like I'm entrusting myself to you. Like there's there's a hope again. Mark, however, has this shocking phrase, Mark fifteen thirty four, where Jesus at the ninth hour he, at ninth hour he what cries with a loud voice, and he says in, in the Aramaic Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani, my God my God why have you forsaken me? So. Uh, Bart Ehrman, the way he presents it, you'd think that Jesus said one of these things or the other. They both kind of have a conflicting thing. But there's actually more in Mark. I'll talk about why this is not uh, a hopelessness in a minute. Well, we're about to get there. But first, let me just say that this is not the last thing Jesus said or the only thing Jesus said in the gospel, according to Mark. Mark 15, 37 through 39, it says Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. This is after he says, why have you forsaken me? He utters a loud cry and breathes his last. Now, I, I want to argue that the loud cry in Mark has content. It's not just a yell, ah, and then he dies. Rather, he, he uttered a loud cry. He said something, and Mark doesn't want to tell you what it is for his own reasons, because he does have a different emphasis, but he does say something. And what happens next is pretty interesting. The veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, that is, while crying out some loud cry, he said, truly this man was the son of God. What I'm going to suggest is the statement in Mark, where we're, we don't know what Jesus said, but he said something. It had content because it helped convert the centurion. This guy becomes a believer. So now let's zoom out and remember how Aaron wants you to see Mark. See Jesus in Mark. Jesus is confused. He's in despair. He feels forsaken. He, he yells out, why have you forsaken me? He screams and then dies. And then the next thing that happens is a centurion goes, wow, look at how ho horribly forsaken and abandoned and hopeless he was. I believe in him too. Like, like obviously this is not Mark's emphasis. That's Ehrman's emphasis, not Mark. Okay, this is nothing to do with the gospel of Mark. This is all about misleading people about the word of God. Sadly, um, that's what it ends up being. 
So even in Mark, there's content in the cry and the content seems hopeful or at least somehow con confirming that Jesus is who he says he is. That's consistent with Luke. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit and then he, then he breathes his last. So yeah, that, that to me is confirmation. The conclusion is this. Jesus in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, he knows what's happening. He knows why it's happening. He has future hope. He, yes, he gets mocked in both gospels. He has shame associated with the cross in both gospels. He has incredible intense agony in both gospels. But in both gospels, those are all part of the plan according to scripture that leads to the salvation of mankind that Jesus intentionally came to do. He deliberately put himself, so to speak, on the cross by refusing to defend himself, by staying in the garden when he knew they were coming, by keeping Judas around when he knew he'd betray him, by walking forward up to the crowd that was coming to seize him, by not defending himself against accusations from the Sanhedrin or against Pilate. Jesus intended the cross, but he dreaded it. Both are true. Both are in both gospels. Yeah. Even the garden scene in Luke is similar. Um, Jesus in, in Luke's garden scene and Mark's garden scene, he's in agony in both gospels, right? But he's also sees it as being according to scripture in both gospels. So yeah, just, just silly. Now, if you, um, then want to talk about Psalm 22, this is, this is to me, it can almost be its own video, but I'm just going to quickly run through a couple things. It's very central to Dr. Ehrman's claims about Mark and Luke being different, that the cry in Mark about, um, my God, why have you forsaken me? That that cry stands by itself outside of the context of Psalm 22. It's very important. It's central. Because Psalm 22, as many of you know, and I've got a video on Psalm 22 down below. You could check that out. Amazing prophecy of the, of the death and resurrection of Messiah. Um, but Psalm 22, it, it would give a new context, a new spin on, the, on what Mark is thinking, the author, as he wants to include this statement from Jesus, why have you forsaken me? It changes it entirely. So if Psalm 22 is what Jesus is referring to, then it not only includes his death, it includes hope and resurrection and future and, and salvation going to the world. Okay, all of that's included in this cry. But Barnerman doesn't want you to think that. So he needs two claims to be true. One, Psalm 22 is not seen as messianic. Um, and two, Jesus is only thinking of Psalm 22 verse 1. He is not thinking of the entire psalm. He is not thinking of the whole thing or especially of the end that speaks of the vindication of the son who is suffering in Psalm 22. So let me read to you. This is a quote from Dr. Bart Ehrman. It wasn't in a video clip, but this is from his book, Jesus Interrupted. It's pages 65 and 66. You can, you can confirm this on your own. I'm going to read a, a paragraph here. This is what Bart Ehrman says about Jesus's cry. Why have you forsaken me? Jesus is silent the entire time as if in shock until his cry at the end, echoing Psalm 22. I take his question of, to God to be a genuine one. He genuinely wants to know why God has left him like this, right? That, now, let's just remind you guys, pause. That ignores everything we've read in Mark, everything, right? Jesus knows why. He knows the purpose. This is, this is Barton Ehrman's another re, mis, fake reconstruction of Mark. Here it's in the book, Jesus um, Interrupted, instead of a lecture he gave. So I take his question to be a genuine one. Uh, he wants to know why God has left him like this. And I continue now quoting Dr. Ehrman. A very popular interpretation of the passage is that since Jesus quotes Psalm 22 verse 1, he's actually thinking about the ending of the psalm where God intervenes and vindicates the suffering psalmist. I think this is reading way too much into the passage and it robs the cry of dereliction, as it is called, of all its power. The point is that Jesus has been rejected by everyone, betrayed by one of his own, denied three times by his closest follower, abandoned by all his disciples, rejected by the Jewish leaders, condemned by the Roman authorities, mocked by the priests, the passerby, and even by the two being crucified with him. At the end, he feels forsaken by God himself. Jesus is absolutely in the depths of despair and heart-wrenching anguish, and that's how he dies. Okay, listen, you guys, I'm reading directly from Bart Ehrman. Here's what he says. Mark is trying to say something by this portrayal. He doesn't want his readers to take solace in the fact that God was really there providing Jesus with physical comfort. He dies in agony, unsure of the reason he must die. Every sentence has serious problems in this, in this paragraph I just read to you. So, this is a, first there's a straw man or, or something we don't need to embrace, okay? It's that Jesus is either thinking of Psalm 22 verse 1 or he's thinking of the ending of the psalm. This is not my theory. I don't know who presents this theory. He quotes verse 1, but he's really thinking of the verses at the end of the psalm. This is, that's a weird theory. I agree. That seems strange. 
I think there's a better theory. Jesus is thinking of the entire psalm, right? Verse 1 included, I'm, yeah, I'm being forsaken. We'll talk about what that meant in a second. Jesus is truly being forsaken, but he's also thinking of the entire psalm, Psalm 22, which includes detailed descriptions of the cross, right? Specific events, as well as his death, as well as his future hope, as well as the gospel going out to the world and people getting saved, all of the above. Is it possible Jesus is thinking of all of the above? Like whenever Jesus talked about the cross, he talked about his death and his resurrection. It was all of the above. <laughs> he talked about how it was a ransom for the world. It wasn't just suffering. It was also to achieve a purpose in Mark's gospel. There's too many coincidences for us, coincidences for us to not be thinking of the entire Psalm because Mark is definitely thinking of the whole Psalm. Let me prove it to you. Okay, Psalm 22, 18. Um, this verse might sound familiar if you read Mark's gospel. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is one of the many verses Mark alludes to. This is in Mark 15, 24. They crucified and divided his garments among, them, among themselves, casting lots for them. You see, Mark is actually alluding to Psalm 22, verse 18, not just verse 1, in his account of Jesus in Mark 15. In Psalm 22, verse 7, you start to see how much Mark wants us to think of the whole psalm. There's only two passages of scripture that Mark continually references in the um, the death or the passion of Christ, right? The, 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 the suffering season right there the, from the garden to the cross. The two passages of scripture are Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, and he references them in various ways throughout this account. So in Psalm 22, 7, it says, all those who see me sneer at me, they separate with the lip, they wag the head. And then they're saying like, you know, you trusted in God. Let's see if God delivers you. Mark 15, 29 those who were passing by, that's what Psalm 22 says, they were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. That's Psalm 22 being referenced, verse 7 being referenced. Uh, Psalm 22, verse 8 is also referenced. I just read it to you where they're saying like, you know, if you commit yourself to God, if you, you know, um, if he delights in you, he'll, uh, he'll rescue you kind of thing. So in Mark 15, 31, Mark alludes to this again. In the same way, the chief priests also among the scribes, along with the scribes, were mocking himself mocking him among themselves and saying he saved others he can't save himself let this let this christ the king of israel now come down from the cross that we may see and believe so th this is another connection to psalm 22 and there's others as well crucifixion uh, because of the lack of time i'll just say this i have a video down below on psalm 22 about how crucifixion has like i think i put maybe 16 or 17 um prophetic uh, allusions or you know ways in which Psalm 22 fits all the details that happened to Jesus while he was going up to the cross, on the cross, and, and even after the cross. But Mark may even be alluding not just to Psalm 22, verse 1, verse 7, verse 8, verse 18, and various other ways. He may be alluding to the end of Psalm 22 in a very interesting way. Mark does this. Mark has subtle theology. Mark's kind of smart like that. Um, and Psalm 22, 7, it talks about the impact of, of this description of a crucified victim, the impact of his death after he is then uh, given a future hope, he'll see his, his posterity, he'll, he'll, he'll have an inheritance, he'll, he'll receive something, he'll have life and inheritance after this as Jesus does. But in Psalm 22, seven, it talks about, and this is, this is a really neat thing, it talks about the worldwide impact. Now, when you prophesy something's gonna happen around the planet, right, worldwide impact, it's kind of a big deal that you get it right. This is what it says will happen as a result of the guy suffering in Psalm 22, which Jesus identifies himself as when he quotes from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, 7, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will worship before you. Now let's put on our Jewish Gentile goggles here for a second. <laughs> this is profound because what it's saying in Israel, which is the bastion of the worship of Yahweh, the true God. It, there's a prophecy, a statement in Psalm 22 about the suffering servant, this guy who goes through, probably the wrong term to use, suffering servant, although I think it is, that is who it is, but this, this, um, this person who dies in a very cross-like fashion, Jesus quotes this passage, Mark refers to it multiple times, but it says that after he dies, that this thing will cause non-Jews, Gentiles, all over the place to worship the God of Israel. That's a big claim, and it has absolutely historically happened. There are Gentiles all around the world, including myself, who worship the God of Israel because of Jesus, the Messiah. That's kind of a profound prophetic thing happening there in Psalm 22, 7. But my point is actually that Mark may specifically allude to this 
in Mark 15, verse 39. Because what happens after the cross, after Jesus dies, the first thing that happens is, well, two things I'll say. The veil is rent, which is to say the way to God is now open, and which would be to Jews and Gentiles. And then the centurion, this Gentile, this non-Jewish man, he believes in Jesus. Immediately, a Gentile comes to Christ, comes to Yahweh because of this. What I'm suggesting is when you look at Mark's entire account of the cross, you see the whole Psalm 22, not just verse 1, and to artificially isolate verse 1 as though the whole point is Jesus is forsaken, end of story, is silly and irrational. Um, again, Bart Ehrman is claiming that Mark's intention is that you only think of verse 1 in Psalm 22. But did you know that it was normal rabbinical like teaching practice to refer to a passage of scripture with the title or the the first verse of that scripture so the reason for this is that back in the day they didn't have chapters and verses so no jew in the first century ever said the phrase psalm 22 this is not saying that because they don't they don't use those terms they would refer to like the um the psalm the my god my god why have you forsaken me psalm and rabbis would refer to the first part of a passage, the first verse or the first phrase in a passage as a way of getting their students to think of the whole passage. That was normal teaching habits. We even see it in the Talmud. They do this. They like quote the first phrase to refer to the whole passage. Um, <clears throat> why is that important? Because Jesus doesn't just quote any old verse. He quotes Psalm 22 verse 1, which directly applies to him on the cross. He's forsaken, and I'll, I'll address this now, only in the sense that he is given over to death on the cross. I'm not talking about the Trinity's ripped in half or something like that. That's not what we're saying. I'm saying that Jesus is given over to a death he doesn't deserve to die for sins he never committed. So he's forsaken. But that's not the whole story. Just like Psalm 22 says it's not the whole story. Right? It's going to lead to the salvation of, of, of God going to the world. Because this is something God actually intends. Just like Jesus said all along. It, that's clearly Mark's intention. So if Jesus wanted to show abandonment with no concept of future hope, which is what Bart Ehrman, Bart's Mark is saying, he could have quoted other passages. There's plenty of other verses in the scripture that, that don't create the problem of Psalm 22 where there's all this future hope and worldwide salvation going on, right? Jesus quotes that passage on purpose. And Mark continually, as you've known, if you've been in my study of the series of, of the Gospel of Mark, Mark continually rewards you who go back and study the context of an Old Testament passage he refers to. He's constantly wanting us to know the thorough context, the verses before and after, the whole section. This is a rewarding thing. Mark obviously is thinking about it the way he uses scripture. Why would it be any different on the cross? And I, I think Jesus knew the Bible pretty well. I think he knew what he was quoting. He could there's a, there's a swami you can quote that has no hope, no mention of hope in it. Could have done that. He didn't quote that. Yeah. All of Psalm 22 fits the understanding of Jesus a lot better than just an isolated taking of verse 1. So for numerous reasons... Dr. Bart Ehrman is incredibly misleading to people. But would you have known it? Like, what if you had just heard his three-minute clip, someone shared it with you, and you just walked away? And you didn't go to Mark, and you didn't do the homework and the study? Would that have messed you up? Would you have started down a road of having more and more skepticism and um, sarcastic attitude towards Scripture where you casually accept any complaint against the Bible, but you don't really thoughtfully examine them to see if they're true. I've seen that happen many times, and that's sad. That's very sad. And hopefully this kind of video is going to help fix that. So we need to see what Mark's trying to show us. And the, the lesson is this. This is how God saves us. Jesus goes to the agony and torment and horror of the cross intentionally because it's going to fulfill scripture and it's going to save you because he dies for your sin so that you could just, like the, like the centurion, like the thief on the cross, you could just trust in Jesus and be forgiven. It's that too good to be true information, right? Well, it's true and it's good. <laughs> and you should, you should catch that emphasis. Um, I'm going to pray with you guys because I want to like, pray anything to the Bible studies, but I'm also have a really big announcement I want to make for you. Um, a resource that we've made available for you that I want to tell you about. And I hope that it's going to bless you. It's all free, but it's coming. Let me pray though. Lord, we lift up our uh, our family and friends right now who are perhaps being uh, influenced by maybe Bart Ehrman or maybe just those who are quoting his material because everybody quotes his stuff. Muslims love quoting his stuff and uh, various different groups quote his stuff and online skeptics uh, 
and all the contention that happens between Christians and skeptics online, it's just, it's a sad thing. We just pray that truth would get out, that people would, would look at the actual word of God themselves and not see it through the filter of Bart Ehrman, but through just the authenticity of its own words. We ask that you help us to be wise, to be good witnesses, to be able to share truth and love, to be able to um, offer the the harshness of a rebuke when it needs to be given and the kindness of a hug when it's needed. We just ask that you use us as witnesses in this world. Uh, skepticism is at an all-time high, but the reasons for it are at an, a usual low. And so we pray that we would be able to be the light and see people coming to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here's the announcement. This is the new Bible Thinker website. Okay, BibleThinker.org has been a website that I made myself, like me, <laughs> who doesn't know anything, and it has never been a good website. Um, but we've had, you know, resources on there for you. Um, we just redone it. It's taken a very long time, and it's still a work in progress. We're still going to keep making it better, but we just redid it. And I want to show you how it works so you can utilize it well. One of the things you'll see is that this is the front page for it. Oh, I didn't show it to you. Hold on. Wait, it's right here. There's the front page for it. And um, one of the things you're going to see is that on the front page, you're going to have our latest videos. This is the stuff that's just come up in the, in the last like week or so. That'll be right on the front page there. You could go to view all videos as well. And that's going to show you like all my video content. Now you could find this on YouTube as well, right? You can find all my videos on YouTube, but YouTube doesn't organize them well. So what we've done is we've organized them well for you. If you scroll down, you can actually browse by series. So here's my first Peter series uh, and it's all free. Progressive Christianity stuff, Catholicism stuff. Um, uh, let's see, the series on homosexuality, evidence for the Bible, um, how to find Jesus in the Old Testament, my, which is my absolute favorite series I've ever done. The marriage and divorce and remarriage, all the videos on that. You can find all kinds of stuff here. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can get a simple text and clickable text of each of the series that we have available. But that's not even, I think, the best part. So on, on YouTube, it's hard to, to follow. Like you go to watch the Mark series and YouTube recommends some other video or they're out of order. Here, they'll be in order. But there's another thing, which is the search feature we've added. This is what's kind of exciting. And countless man hours have gone into this um, to create this, this searchable feature. Um, okay, so you can search my videos. A general way of searching the videos is so like you could go to the normal search. There's two search functions. The normal one, you can click on, oh, Passion Translation. I'll go there. So I'll click that and it should bring up every whole video that's that's related to the topic of the Passion Translation. But you're just going to get whole videos, which I've obviously talked about that a lot. So there's going to be a lot of videos there. The Passion Project is also available there. But what's the most exciting part to me is the Q&A search. The Q&A search doesn't just search for a video related to a topic. See, a lot of times I'll talk about an issue for one or two or five minutes in the middle of another long video. The Q&A search helps you find those moments. So if you go to the Q&A search, and let's say you want to search by a keyword or phrase. You could say something like um, word of faith. You want to see where have I talked about word of faith stuff? Well, this is actually going to give you, here's three results where I've dealt with word of faith issues, but it takes you to exactly, okay, here's a guy who says, my pastor teaches that we're little gods from the word of faith movement. And then how important is this issue? The person asks. It'll open up a video and take you to literally the exact moment in the video where I deal with that question. Why is this fruitful? Because we are always getting um, people asking us questions that are, are like, hey, where does Mike talk about this issue? Where does he talk about that issue? And this is creating that resource on the website for you. You could also go to topics and just scroll down and find things like um, Chris Tomlin, uh, Christian artist, Christian liberty, Christmas, contemporary English Bible, where I've talked about that, Coptic Christianity. Recently, I, I talked about that briefly. You won't find this on YouTube like this. You won't find it nor anywhere else. You will find it on the Q&A search thing. So I would recommend you guys check this out. Also, um, for a lot of my studies, we do make the notes available and they're available for free on the website. So for instance, um, let's talk about, here we go. This is in the Mark series. Um, the last video I believe I taught in the Mark series. You can actually find the, 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 um, I think it might be the download button. I guess I should have checked the search, but our notes are on here. They're available somewhere on here where you can actually download the notes from the study if that is something to be fruitful for you. If anybody would like to plagiarize me, 
I don't care. <laughs> so, but I want to give a, a special thanks because a number of volunteers, uh, Sarah Zimmerman, who's actually works for Bible Thinker, she's the only other employee, but also a number of volunteers that she's helped coordinate have put in tons of hours. So I want to thank you guys. So Jasmine Martin, Hope Kuhn, Caleb Redman, Orlando Debian, uh, Ashley Joachinson, and Bo Barkley. You guys are wonderful. You've put lots of hours into finding timestamps to videos to make this stuff available. The whole goal here with my ministry is free content that helps people think biblically. And this search feature, I think, is going to help people do that. So check out the website. If you find bugs or weird things, please let us know. Um, we would like to be aware of that. And that's about it. I will see you guys on Friday. And um, I might have another video, probably another video this week on Wednesday. I'll upload something. And I am very, very grateful. If this has helped you in some way, please let me know. If you want to help the content reach more people, it does help, I think. If you click like, I'm not sure how much YouTube cares about that. But I think it matters. If you click like, you know, share the content, comments, and things like that. They do help other people to get the stuff and for it to help them. So thank you so much. Lord bless you all. Have a wonderful day.